theater. And uh, a very old story from, if you happen to be a Calgarian, there was a house on the roof of this, and it was the only legal house in downtown Calgary. And it had the most famous underground parties, well, rooftop parties, in the 50s and 60s and, uh, that you've ever seen, uh, right in this building. Um, this is about enterprise blockchain. It's, it's not gonna be involving cryptos like we heard in the, in the prior uh, conversation. And uh, Alberta is literally poised, if not there, uh, being a world leader in blockchain and enterprise blockchain. Check out the Alberta Credentials Ecosystem uh, website. Um, you know, leaders in consumer identity and what's rolling out. I know from working with uh, partners down in Ottawa, the federal government uh, released its consumer identity platform for blockchain uh, a couple of weeks ago and it's going to be a, a topic of debate amongst all federal parties. And, uh, and it's wonderful and we got Guild One in the province as well because they are absolute leaders in the blockchain and the energy distribution world. Uh, my name is Wayne Logan. I work with Wheeler Thompson. I'm chairman of the uh, uh, Blockchain Task Force. The reason I got involved is I'm an entertainment lawyer, so uh, entertainment royalties and distribution uh, caught my attention. Uh, since then, I've really, really learned a lot and uh, very happy to be here. So I'm going to let each panelist introduce themselves and then we'll ask a few questions. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Hubert Lau from uh, Trust Bix. I think I'm on the wrong panel. I thought I was here to talk about my alcoholic tendencies. Uh, but, uh, well, since I'm here, I better stay, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, what we do is, uh, you know, the, the, the vision of our company is to create a world where we can trust more, waste less, and reward sustainable behavior. And in, in driving in, in our focus, our, what we look at is, how do we create business solutions that would drive up the value of products such as food? And in, in driving up that value then is how do we reward all the participants who gives us that value right, and create that value? And then we lock it all down with our blockchain infrastructure. So we can uh, talk about that later. Right? Yeah, good. Uh, they, they, fascinating business that Hubert's uh, leading. Good morning, uh, my name is Stuart Pearson. I'm uh, Senior Vice President of Agriculture for MNP. Um, our company is uh, a business advisor uh, company. Our, our Initially, our focus was on producers, and it still is. We do still focus a lot on uh, agriculture producers. Um, but we have, uh, over the years, come to work with many uh, different organizations right through the supply chain uh, for food products. And for our, our interest in, uh, in blockchain technology is just to uh, you know, get, get more aware of what our clients will be facing and what role our company uh, will play in that. Um, I'm also a producer myself, uh, co-own a, a grain farm in Saskatchewan with a couple of other uh, individuals. And so I do, uh, I do see uh, a lot of what's the changes that are coming out there. I do see how they're impacting our farm and uh, I do, uh, I am interested to see how, what we're gonna have to change on our farm to, uh, to keep up. Thank you, Stuart, Karen? Yeah, hi, I'm Karen Flett, uh, National Sales Manager for a local Calgary company, uh, Canada Malting, but part of a larger organization, uh, Grain Corp. And um, the reason I'm up here is uh, I started working with our strategy innovation team on what technologies are gonna change farming or processing and, and how do we incorporate those technologies? How do we see uh, which technologies we wanna invest in, we wanna incorporate into our business, which technologies are gonna change the way our farmers live? And so uh, that led me to, to do a project that incorporated two of my favorite things, which are beer and technology. So um, we did a blockchain uh, farm to beer project, which was uh, awesome. And, involved some local companies, uh, involved a, a farming entity that we're very close with, and um, yeah, looking forward to the panel. Jane? Thank you, uh, thanks Wayne. My name is James Benke, I work for Olds College. I've been there for a little bit over one year. I come from the private sector, so it's been uh, an interesting shift uh, for myself uh, from a career path. I, I serve likely two functions within the college right now. One is leading and developing new credentials at Olds College that align to not only where the needs of the ag industry are today, uh, but as we move into the future. And secondly, uh, I have a heavy emphasis within my role uh, working with the industry groups and partnerships 
to continue to develop the, uh, the smart egg ecosystem at Olds College. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background on that. We are going to heavily in influence uh, and, and bring industry in to help not only guide um, the new credentials to ensure that our students, when they exit uh, the college, are exiting uh, in a more productive state and also uh, ensure that the students get hands-on learning in a real-time environment working with industry groups um, to get introduced to break to make mistakes within real-world technologies and also agricultural production. Um, so I use the word smart ag. We uh, have been on a venture for about two years now with our commercial farm at Olds College. It is uh, aptly named Olds College Smart Farm where we're bringing in technologies, working with industry to enable uh, the technology integration into uh, our classroom and bring our classroom out to that living lab environment. Um, of course, we've definitely had some significant challenges through that, but uh, we believe it's important and we believe it's a catalyst to ensuring that we're graduating effective students as they move forward. Um, the premise for the smart farm, um, I think functionally, uh, builds into functionality uh, and technologies like blockchain. Um, probably the one of the most fundamental ways that I look at Smart Farm, uh, I also am a producer like Stuart, and my grandfather, my great-grandfather, uh, on both sides, my mom and dad, took 85 years to carve out a farming career. Um, as we explore new data, new technologies, new best management practices, I, as a young producer, want to accelerate that, and I want to accelerate an 85-year farming career into let's call it 35, 40, or 50 years. And those are the uh, types of uh, technologies and tools we're gonna be training students to, to use. Uh, how do they leverage technology to make more enhanced decision making? Uh, quicker, faster, better, cheaper. So that's what I represent on the stage today. Good, thanks James. And uh, I was at the Olds College for Canada 2020, and it was about October. You were there too, Hubert. And it was absolutely one of the better blockchain uh, conferences that I've been at. and. Uh, the 3D printing machine that you have in your library is really, really, really interesting on uh, what you can do. So, go down the panel, a general question, and uh, we don't, we'll stop it if we get too repetitive, but um, Hubert, we'll start with you. What advantages does blockchain offer the ag industry as compared to legacy reporting? Because lots of times a centralized database can handle it just fine. So what are your thoughts on the advantages? Well, aside from the, the obvious of the immutability and so forth uh, on blockchain from, from our point of view, is that the, the real advantage is trust. Right? And, and often when we're talking different countries, we're talking different segments uh, uh, between the buyers and the seller, is how do you trust each other and how do you create a faster speed of trust? And the, the concept there is that if we can <clears throat> control well the inputs and output that is going to happen to facilitate a business transaction, then the blockchain gives it that additional level of trust. And so when we look at blockchain uh, solutions for the egg industry, uh, first off, what we ask ourselves is what, you know, what problem are we solving? Is, and what's the business model? Who's going to pay for it? And then we look at how blockchain can play into those solutions properly so I heard one person one time said is, you know, many people are looking at blockchain as like a hammer and you're gonna use this one hammer to build a whole building, right? It doesn't work that way. So, but it is a great tool in your tool belt or in your toolbox when you're building a house, but you have to figure out the foundation that it makes sense before you do everything else. So our right, advantage we look at is really to create more trust in, in, in the ecosystem that we work in. Stuart, do you have any comments you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would agree with Hubert on that. Trust is a, is a big component of it. Um, from the producer side, we are collecting enormous amounts of data, whether it's from the machines um, or whether it's just even manually tracked uh, data on our operations. And it's all sitting there. Um, we don't always know if we have it, have it accurate. So we need to figure out ways to verify and, and ensure that data is accurate because there's nothing worse than a database with a whole bunch of garbage in it. It's not usable, right? So with blockchain technology, we're hoping that will be one component of us moving down the road to better verifiability of data, better accuracy of the data, um, and then also an easier platform to kind of bring it together 
and, and make it more usable in a timely fashion. Um, you know, historic, we talk about historic databases and the way we've been doing it. Well, at the producer level right now, a lot of times it takes us months to get that data put together into some sort of form that we can actually start using it and making decisions. If we can get the data um, accessible, trust, trust it, and use it in real time, all of a sudden our uh, decision making is a lot easier and hopefully um, it, it results in either, um, we talked this morning, what were the benefits? Is it a cost reduction or is it a, a revenue generator? Well, I'm hoping it'll do both uh, for agriculture. Um, but I can see areas where it's definitely a cost reducer. I can see other areas where it has potential for, uh, for revenue generation. And, and I think where that comes in is up the supply chain when we're trying to, trying to uh, let the world know what our product is and how we grew it and, and, and whether it's safe to, to consume that product as part of the food supply. How is it a revenue generator? Well, we had a bit of a debate this morning with these two gentlemen up front, and, and we didn't have consensus on this, but um, there was a couple of us thinking, you know, if, if you can source your food and know exactly how that food has been prepared, you know exactly how the farmer takes care of the environment when they do that, um, are you willing to pay a premium for that food? Or... Um, the other side of that is, will producers who can't provide that information end up taking a discount on their product? So maybe the price doesn't change, but maybe non-verifiable products are worth less? I well, don't know. We'd well, your margins would probably be better because you're re definitely reducing your expenses. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good. Do you have anything to add on, uh, on that, Karen? Yeah. Um, trust is definitely a big part of it. But um, as a kind of a middleman, as the processor who connects farmers to end users, we also, I view it as connection. So how do we connect with our farmers more efficiently? How do we connect, um, how do we transfer information um, and product at uh, a more efficient, uh, more cost-effective way? Uh, information transfer, everything like that. And then just the whole story chain. So how do we tell the story of our farmers to our end users? How do we let the end users tell that story to the consumer. Um, and so for us, it's a connection. So how do we connect all three s pieces of the chain? And, um, and we try to do that today, but you know, for us, we view technology uh, as a whole, but you know, blockchain as a possible um, way to, to easier, easily do that um, across the entire supply chain. Good, thank you. James, you got a, anything to add? Yeah, I, I might have a little bit uh, further to add, I guess, from, from my perspective. Um, you know, blockchain really is a, it's a, a function of systems, right? And when we look at it, I think all those systems lend itself kindly to agriculture and the transactions that occur within agriculture. So I will reiterate uh, the panelists here that trust is a big one. Uh, I do look at probably three, and I think it all builds towards trust, is identity, reputation, and at the end of the day, incentive. Hubert talked about it. Um, to get producers and our industry to adopt, there needs to be appropriate incentives, but there's also a disincentive on some levels. Um, so I believe in the package of all those three uh, pieces, I think that's what we'll see uh, the furthering of adoption of that type of technology uh, as we move forward. And uh, really just a ground level awareness as to what it is. Um, blockchain for some of our producers is a scary word. They don't understand it. They don't need to be deep generalists or technologists within it or a pure practitioner, but they really need to understand that. And at the end of the day, they're trying to continue to maintain and sustain a business appropriately. Uh, and, and parts of that are in that identity, the reputation of what they do. You wouldn't find a, probably a stronger group in, in the world that says their reputation means more than, than success in the business. So this is one way that they can validate that. And then the, the third piece is really the incentive to do so. Well, the producer would be the genesis of the block, right? And so you're educating them on, like, it's pretty easy to create a block and then get the inputs going and get the certification and whatnot. So how's your enrollment going? Do you have interest from, is it just young people or is it f older generation uh, producers? Yeah, it's fascinating, actually. Our application's open for the new programming uh, October 1st, 2019. We're getting calls from all over the world. We're not even using words like blockchain within this. We're talking about precision agriculture, actually, and agriculture technology. 
which I hope to most people understand that it implies or applies all sorts of technologies to that and we're going to be looking at the return on investment of that. I've received calls from Brazil from um, agribusiness leaders that are in their mid-50s that are interested in this because they've ran businesses and they've been inundated by technology companies to come and insert and implement their technologies within citrus farms and all that but they really don't have any understanding of that. They're, they're hardcore business people, but they really don't understand it. They see opportunity in that, and they're interested in coming to Olds College, believe it or not, to learn some of this, but they're also piqued, what's also piqued their interest is the involvement of industry. If I come to Olds College, will I get the training that I need? Will I get exposure to industry, and will I be able to actually move my career in a different path? I love agriculture, but I want to do it in a different way. Uh, we're also getting expressed interest uh, from 18 year olds, uh, you know, beyond technology, they're very interested in food, what goes into that, what doesn't go into it. Uh, so we're actually, it's going to be quite a dynamic group uh, within that. And then ultimately, as we're developing out the programming right now and the, the levels of curriculum, which I don't really want to get into here, but how do you look at the blockchain component and how do you teach that? Um, there's no way in our, for our one program as a two-year program that we're going to graduate blockchain practitioners. No chance. Uh, but what we will be able to have is enter them into that phase so hopefully it instills a passion in them to continue to learn either through that school channel or externally with practitioners such as yourselves. Uh, so that's, that's really what we're looking to do. Oh good, that's very interesting. Uh, Hubert? Can, can I jump in on that? I, you know, so I, I think the Producers definitely the beginning of the chain if you're talking about traceability, sustainability, and so forth. And when we were looking at that uh, <clears throat> as, a, as a problem, as I traveled around the world and talking not just in the beef sector, but any of the food sectors, as soon as you talk about traceability and, and food safety, they all had the same problem. Producers were not engaging in putting data in. So even if you had a good blockchain infrastructure, there's no data. And uh, so we actually went back to the drawing board and looked at, well, what can we do to create that momentum and so when we start talking to producers it was very simple consumers today want more information we want to know the provenance of our food we want to know how it's raised and everything else around that and we're demanding more and more and more but the producers are not getting paid for it so if tomorrow you go to work and your your boss or your spouse decides to say look you got to do 50 percent more work but no extra pay how motivated are you to do that chances are it's none so we went to uh, uh, retailers like McDonald's and, uh, and, and uh, Loblaws and so forth and said, look, if you want sustainability in, in your beef products, we need to have a way to pay the producers. And so today, there is a pilot called the Canadian Beef Sustainability Acceleration Pilot. It's on the second year. Uh, we had helped create it in, in partnership with Cargill. And what it does is that it allows us to go on site uh, with our partners to do an audit, on-farm audit, to make sure they are practicing sustainable practices for beef production, for cattle raising. And that if, uh, and we as TrustBix track it as a neutral third party, and funds are distributed, uh, are deposited into our trust account by the retailer. So who's involved now is McDonald's, Loblaws, Cactus Club, Swiss Chalet, Original Joe's and Harvey's. And they're all putting money in the pool and we distribute it every quarter right up the supply chain to the producers' pockets. And this is the first time ever that producers are being rewarded for sustainable behavior. And if you think about it, they are being, they are being rewarded on things that they have been doing for decades, but now is verified and certified. And so this money goes straight to the bottom line. So this makes them more profitable. So earlier you're asking, well, how, how does this make money? Well, it make, you have to make money for everyone. So the producers make money, the feedlots make money, the packers make money, right? You know, we make money and the retailers can uh, answer the call of the consumers of what they want. So today, Canada is the very first country in the world to have a fully certified, sustainable, beef supply chain. And Old College is one of our, our, our producer groups too. I remember that we've distributed money to Old College as well for the student farm because they too practice sustainable practices right, in production. Absolutely. 
that must have been a eureka moment for your board of directors to, fit, to, to find the way to reward everybody in the chain. Uh, well, really well done, Hubert. I think that's fantastic. There was a famous comment here in Alberta, shoot, shovel, and shut up, right? When something goes wrong in the beef industry. Um, uh, I guess that doesn't apply anymore. But, uh, but Stuart, the, uh, China has put Canada's meat exports on hold. With, uh, and, and, and canola, I think, as well, and some other things. So the, the, the blockchain must help saying either you're wrong or yes, you're right, that we have problems with our food supply. So you comment on that? Yeah, so <clears throat> the shoot, shovel, and shut up philosophy might not be totally dead <laughs> as much as we'd like it to be. But it, uh, I think what we're seeing with blockchain technology and other technologies as well is that we may not need that anymore, right? Because if we can, if we can isolate and define or, and figure out where that, that problem is, uh, we don't need to go and start euthanizing entire flocks of birds or, or herds when we, we're just unsure, right? Um, we also, as, as uh, Kalea mentioned this morning, you know, retailers don't have to go and clean off their entire shelves because they know, okay, there's a problem. It's, it's, they can narrow it down and they say, well, any products produced from this supplier on this, this exact time have the issue. The rest of this is all okay. Um, so I, I think with the China issue, again, uh, the, the work that Hubert's uh, company is doing is extremely beneficial in that. I think it will allow us to uh, shorten the time of any border closures or maybe eliminate them altogether because we will have that information available so that when there are problems, we can isolate them and say, okay, this is the issue. You know, 99% of everything else is that we're trying to trade is fine, so let's keep the border open. We know what we're looking for. If we find this, it's got to be tossed or it's got, that has to be set back. Well, MNP, as a you know, highly respected Canadian firm that does audits, I'm sure that you could go in and audit that block, that file, and say, yeah, you're, this is pure or not, right? So uh, have you done that yet uh, under MNP? Um, not that I'm aware of, but it's definitely on our list. It's one of the things we talked about early on as we were getting involved in this is um, MNP, along with you know many other um, audit advisory firms, we are looked at as as trusted people in in the business community. And so, you know, if we're auditing businesses financially, can we play a role in auditing even non-financial uh, data such as this, and be part of that verification process? And I think there absolutely is a space there. Um, you know, firms like ours would would have done a lot of the, because we've done it for so long, we, we kind of know how that space works and how, what you need to do to make sure the trust is there. So can we replicate that? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's a bit of a different, uh, different angle and what we've seen on the financial side, but I wonder, sure. if, your, I wonder if your insurance would cover it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> well, you, you know what, Stuart, just do it. <laughs> I don't think we can get, I can get away with that myself, but our insurer, our reinsurer might have a, a few uh, things to say, but yeah. everybody knows with insurance, I mean, the, they'll, they, they have some of the best data in the world, so they'll know what their risk is and, and they'll know whether they're willing to insure us or not. Well, we're, we've analyzed as from a law firm when you're doing smart contracts, if you were know, pronouncing on that final agreement, does our insurance cover it? And the answer is yes. Assuming you give an opinion letter. Can, 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 I, can I jump in on that channel? Oh, sorry. Yeah. You go ahead. Go ahead Just one more comment on that. And I think the other thing with the blockchain, when you mentioned China, and we have a similar issue going on with India, we have similar issues with, with some other countries, um, you know, making claims that our products are unsafe or that, or that there's an issue. The hope is that with blockchain, we can we can dispel that and, and get the real information out there. Um, and it's not just with international trade, but it's even with consumer products. Uh, when we watch advertising on television these days, or, or whether it's on your social media or wherever, we see all sorts of fear mongering going on uh, in the food chain and, and what I would call false advertising. Um, the number of things that are labeled, you know, uh, gluten free or non GMO and 
you know, like, well, of, of course they're gluten free. There's, there's no gluten in the ingredients. Like what, so, you know, like we're not actually buying anything that's special here. It's just, yeah, I, lots of things are gluten free. Um, but yet, you know, when they, when that labeling is used, it's, it's sometimes used to, to put a premium on, on the price of a product. And it's, it's, in my opinion, it's, it's a bit of false advertising in that case. So hopefully with this technology, we'd be able to, um, bring some more clarity to the public on that and allow them to make their own decisions as to whether or not they actually are getting the right information. You were? Uh, and McDonald's was one of those ones that, uh, you know, we asked them about, well, you saw what AMW was advertising and what they were advertising for AMW was, we followed the law, is really what they were saying. But uh, McDonald's said, we, we can't play that game because of our worldwide name. We need to make sure everything is verified, validated by a third party and that there's a go-to. So if, uh, you know, next time you have your Angus burger and you see the sustainable logo and if one of you decide to challenge McDonald's on it, they're going to point you my way and say, go talk to Trustbex. They have the data. They'll tell you the story. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. So it's really important to have that trust and be neutral. And again, that's where the blockchain kind of plays the role uh, in the business model. Um, but I really want to talk about China for a second, if it's okay. Can I, can I, uh, so I've had the, uh, the pleasure of, of spending time uh, with the Deputy Agricultural Minister of China um, and, and talk about some of the trade issues as well as the, uh, at the time, the Acting Ambassador of Canada in China. So, um, and have some really extensive private discussions. So just so you all know, because we don't get the news like Stuart is kind of alluding to, is that what actually happened is the, there were documents that, you know, from the pork industry that was sent to, to China. And that the company it was referenced is a real company out of Montreal. And I met the owner and says, yeah, it was actually my company. And I'm like, oh, geez. Uh, and then there's a, a veterinarian signature on it, which is a real vet. But the whole document was fraudulent. So the company didn't send the product the veterinarian actually did not sign off on it, but the documents are. Somehow it made it into our Canadian government systems. And that's why it was a problem. So legitimately, China is saying, look, guys, Canada, I don't know what to trust. Because if you may potentially have compromised, uh, uh, like, like documents that are compromising in your system, we now don't know what to trust. So China had two choices. The first choice, which most countries would do, is though to shut the border down. And that's within their rights to do that for public safety. If they did that, after we satisfy all requirements as a country, it could take months to years to reopen the borders to China. So what did the Chinese do? This is the part you'll never hear in the news. They actually put our border and export on hold, which means that the very next day after we satisfied the Chinese government that we got our act together, they can allow shipments again. Now, this doesn't get advertised because it's not sensational, right? That China is actually the good guys and they're actually helping Canada and what we are doing and try to support our agricultural industry. But so when we're talking about, well, what can blockchain do? And so when I sat down with, the, with, with, with our Canadian uh, uh, ambassador team, and, and as well as with, with, the, with the deputy minister of agriculture, the idea there is like, what can we do to help facilitate that type of trust quickly to maybe help reopen the borders again? But it still needs, you know, even if we can play a role in, in creating the blockchain, we still have to make sure the input of the documentation is going to be correct. So there is more work to be done in the background, but blockchain does provide a portion of the solution that's critical. That's very interesting. Um, Kieran, just get you involved here. Would there be a positive impact uh, to human health and safety by incorporating uh, blockchain into the agri-food supply? It's, I mean, we're talking about provenance here, but what about uh, safety and uh, health and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, um, obviously there's tons of examples of uh, recalls and food recalls where if you have the access to information of the farm it's coming off of or the contamination that's hit um, 
you can save lives and you can save time and, and millions of dollars can be at stake. So um, I think on the food and safety thing, it, it's definitely very valuable. Um, you know, for us, it's on the grain side, it's a lot less risk for us, um, but we still see it as a benefit where, you know, some worst case scenario, um, we have a contamination or we have um, infection. Uh, it's great to understand where that comes from. Is the whole bin contaminated? Is the field uh, been infected with the fungus or, or something along those lines? Um, in the end, it helps not only us, but maybe we are able to provide that to our farmer. We allow them to make decisions based off of plant, um, for next year's planting or for even that crop year, what they want to do with their product. And uh, again, for us, it's, it's about supporting our farmers uh, in the long run. And so um, whether we can provide additional funds due to better quality products or provide help due to information, um, I think uh, technology can assist on both sides. Yeah, that's interesting. I know on the Providence side of thing, when I, uh, I really appreciate it when my cannabis is balanced properly between the THC and the CBD. <laughs> but I can't remember which one I like better. <laughs> Only Sorry. it was on the blockchain. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I mean, I don't know if this is out yet, but I, I, I read an article where there'll be, uh, you'll be able to scan the barcode on your steak or the lettuce. And it'll literally say, you know, Charlie the cow, here's where it came from, or, or here's where your lettuce was grown. And has that been commercialized? Uh, so know? the project we did actually, we did that on our beer. Um, it was a QR code. You could scan it. You could watch a video. Um, we actually installed cameras into our farmer's field, and you could watch from all the way from planting all the way to harvest. You could actually see different. You could go on. We could go on and see how much rain it got on certain days, and. And so now we're thinking about, well, what, what, how do we utilize this data? But as a consumer, you could go watch, you know, who's the farmer hauling it? What day was it hauled? Uh, where did it go? Well, you know, went to Canada Malting, was malted, brought back out to a little local roaster, and then shown again, being delivered to the brewery. Um, you can see, you know, the date that it was brewed on, all that information was accessible. And so it was a really cool project. You know, for us, it's maybe not tomorrow, every beer is gonna have a QR code. It probably doesn't add value to every beer to have that, but. It was a great way for one of our consumers and for us to tell the story of the supply chain um, and show that it is uh, possible to do so. Um, yeah, it was a really fun uh, uh, project to go through and um, I think provided value to, to uh, both sides. And you're giving us all a beer today or something? That yeah, I hope cool. so. Yeah. Correct, good, good. So, I might have you drank know, them all. But. We're understanding from the panel, and a lot of us instinctively understand the advantages of blockchain, um, but do we, does the panel have any sense on how widely, uh, how many businesses are like yours, Hubert? How many businesses are getting into it, and and uh, what are the regulatory hurdles? Uh, like, I sit here and listen. You'd think there'd be a lot of producers, whatever it is they're producing, to take advantage of this new technology. Is it widespread? Does, do you have a know? What were your regulatory hurdles? Did you have any? Uh, from our side, we don't because. The role we try to play is the value add role. So we're, we're not, we don't want to be regulators or be a regulatory system. And that, that often when we sit down with the different government entities, they really want to keep that piece. Now, they use us as a, a, as a consultative, consultative and advisory arm to help them design the regulatory side. And uh, we're just as happy because you don't make money getting into the regulatory business. Well, at least I don't. Uh, but you do make money by helping people drive value in their products. So you drive value, and Stuart, I think you, you hit it dead on earlier, is that you drive value either by increasing the price or by not losing market share, right? So we look at it from those angles. And, but to answer your first question is, are, are there a lot of companies going out? What we saw in the, you know, in the last few, uh, couple of years was there, there's this, you know, with, when the Bitcoin was crazy, people just associate Bitcoin with blockchain, which is, of course, uh, erroneous. But then you had all these companies just felt blockchain was just the answer for everything. And, and, uh, and the stock market responded to it, so, so then people did even more. Now what you're seeing is the, the softening of the uh, froth that's come off on the stock market on those softening on those, and now the, the real players are left. So it reminded me of the, 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 the tech bubble back in the pre-2000, right? Anything.com made money, and then it bursted, and the ones that were left over were the strong players that dominated the market over time. And that's what I'm seeing in the blockchain and uh, uh, sector uh, in private industry, 
And in agricultural, same thing, is that the strong players are looking at the business model first, building the blockchain accordingly, using it as a tool, and those are the ones that looks like they're gonna survive. And there's less and less players now that we're seeing that's trying to promote blockchain as their system. But what we see is the quiet development underneath that they're just, you know, so it's like a tool that they just put into place so that when time comes, that people question the, the, the trustworthiness of their information or their, their products, they can showcase that, right? I'll just make a comment here before we open it up to the floor for questions, and it has to do with regulations. Uh, our law firm looked at uh, all kinds of provincial and federal statutes to see if there was any technological restrictions on receiving data, legacy, uh, like was there a restriction that you had to, you couldn't use technology to to do your reporting, you know, versus spreadsheet reporting or what have you? And the answer is no. There were no technology restrictions. So if, for the entrepreneurs here that are thinking about using, jumping into the blockchain world, chances are you don't have any regular, and we're not talking cryptocurrency here, you don't have any regulatory hurdles. As long as you meet the, the current reporting requirements, there's no reason why the reporting can't be by way of blockchain. And I think that's really important to reinforce. So, hi Pam. Questions? Here we go. Okay, um, so I have been very skeptical of, of many uses of blockchain. One of the things I'm, one of the things I'm skeptical of is supply chain. So, my main issue is how do you, the technology of a, of a blockchain is meant to kind of introduce a, a trustless layer of information. How do you prevent, you were talking about bad inputs onto the blockchain. If you put garbage on a blockchain, it's still, it's still garbage information. So how do you prevent bad inputs uh, for non-digital assets because you're trying to peg information on a blockchain to a real world asset. And even if you successfully get that real world asset accurately put on the blockchain, what blockchain are you using? How are you securing it? Because um, the consensus mechanism for what's on the blockchain can be reverted if somebody gains uh, more than 51% of of basically the network. So are, are you creating your own blockchain to do this? Are you utilizing another blockchain? Because people may not realize, but in, in the realm of cryptocurrency, there's been many times where blockchains have been attacked and essentially somebody goes and converts a currency for, uh, you know, as something else takes it off in an exchange. And then after the fact, somebody's able to reverse reverse the transaction so it never happened. So how do you keep um, that data, if it's correctly entered, how do you keep it sound? Um, and how do you prevent that? What blockchain are you using? And how do you get it entered correctly? Well, I challenge you on a little bit of that question. The, we, uh, the farmer that grows the crops or raises the cattle, like, you'll go buy your bread and you, there's pretty good assumption that he hasn't pissed on the, on the grain that went in there, right? Yeah. Well, you have to continue that assumption. Yeah. And so when they enter their data, <laughs> when they enter their data, they're honest people. And, and what my experience is, is the, um, the non-profit associations for grain, grain people, agricultural people, cannabis people, they work with the producers to ensure that they understand it and virtually everybody that is a member of that nonprofit group and is a producer focuses on being honest and focused on, so I have confidence that their inputs are proper. And then when that cattle industry, when they send out a certification to the vet that says, please certify that you gave it these shots and did that, that vet will take it very, very seriously. So. You, and then you're bringing in your analogy of crypto. Well, I discard that because this has nothing to do with cryptocurrency. So the security of the block depends upon what platform you're on. I know uh, 
our great client Guild One, they're on the uh, Corda platform. So a lot of it's on the platform that you're on that offers the security, okay? Um, anybody here? Yeah, I would just uh, add that for us, when we think about uh, serial agriculture, we know that we're, um, we need a lot of infrastructure still to make it a, a system that's viable for both us and for our farmers. But in my head, you know, once you get to a stage where you know, it's not maybe just the farmer inputting his bin data into a system that populates it to us, that populates it further to a consumer, but it's actually data that's being retrieved as the grain is being harvested or as it's being put into a bin. And that data is automatically populated based off of sensory um, inputs or, or something like that. That's where I see the, the value really come into full tilt for both farmers and us to have more efficient system, more efficient supply chain where, you know, there's no input errors. We're actually understanding what, what we have in the bins and what we have coming towards us. And we can make the supply chain more effective. We can cut down on gas emissions, we can cut down all those things just by being a more efficient supply chain across the board and, and hopefully retrieve some value from our farmer based off of that segregation, so. Yeah, a, a cattle rancher, me, correct me if I'm wrong, Huber, but a cattle rancher would have, right now has five different databases that they got, if they're not using your system, they got a report to on the life of that cow from birth to slaughterhouse, correct? At least five. I mean, there, there's, five. There's, there's more. I mean, uh, I'll go, uh, I won't go as far as your, 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 your peeing analogy, but, uh, but I was just thinking, you know, uh, being Asian, I can say this because uh, most of you probably have driven your car and say, God darn it, those Asian drivers. But yeah, we have a driver's license. Yeah, this morning, as a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah, I got a driver's license, and it's good for a, while, a period of time. So, so uh, you guys have to keep putting up with me, uh, and all of my brothers and sisters. And, and so the, the idea there is there's always a level of trust that has to be here. And, and, and your question's really good in the sense that we always have to recognize that the physical world and the digital world, there is a disparity. And that's why I alluded to the, the input side. And the way we looked at that is that uh, <clears throat> we're always going to look for improvement to create more validity of the data coming in. But we also have to recognize that at some point you got to trust somebody, right? At some point, like no, no matter, even in the purest form of, of blockchain, at some point there is a, some level of trust that the, the, the computer wasn't compromised. Like, like you have to trust something, right? And then in regards to um, the, the, what are we doing the blockchain on? What we're really doing the blockchain on ourselves is actually the transactional data. More, you know, so we're not trying to do everything. Because part of it is also the, you know, if we're talking about sustainability with, you know, with uh, blockchain in, in the purest form, how much computing power do you need which means how much electricity are we gonna chew up, you know, and, and the equation starts going, and so then you're asking yourself, geez, you're trying to promote sustainable cows, but if our blockchain is really not great for the environment either, that we're not doing the right thing either. So we had to find a balance so that we too are holding ourselves accountable as a provider. Uh, what are we doing today in terms of a blockchain versus a, a private? We are doing a consortium blockchain uh, uh, method. Uh, again, part of it is that our in-house uh, uh, council uh, is struggling with the question that does a public blockchain violate privacy laws around the world? Now there's a debate about that, so we thought until that debate gets resolved, we better keep it in-house for now just so that we have that control and we're not going to be called offside on those. But I will temper that with that privacy laws only apply to personal information, not corporate. It is, but it is still part, once you get to the producer level, it becomes personal at, at, at some point. So we, we're actually, because we have to issue the, the, the funds to somebody, right? And so we, we, are, we are struggling a little bit on, on that side of the equation, but it's all part of the, the, the evolution uh, uh, of emerging technologies. It's part of the fun of discovering and, and hitting those, those roadblocks and, and, and working collaboratively with the industry. And this morning there was a discussion about creating ecosystems, why we're big supporters of ecosystems because we don't have all the answers ourselves. We need to reach out, like we work very closely with Old College because I quite often we call them up and say, we need your input, we need your help, and vice versa. And with MNP, same thing. You know, they, they're part of our ecosystem, right? and we're just gonna get to know you more, especially uh, if we've got the beers. See you after.
And I think okay. that's, uh, I just want to add a quick piece to that. I think you're starting to see more and more mass collaboration within that. Uh, you know, from the college perspective, we bring that academic lens to it. Uh, we can teach some of the game theory. When you start to look at some of the open source mass collaboration that happens, it doesn't necessarily mean or enhance the trust of it, but when it's in a consortium environment, um, you're seeing some of these more public blockchains in other parts of the world, especially around food, start to occur because I think uh, uh, because of that, and I, and I think because of the de-risking of that function and enhancing the trust of it. So I believe it's a mass collaboration cross-sector we don't have the answers and I can sit on the, the panel here today as a producer and somebody in an academic institution. Agriculture needs more help uh, and a lot of help to help solve some of our grandest challenges. We can't do it on our own. So I, I strongly encourage the mass collaboration aspect to, to support that. Oh good, that's a good comment, James. <laughs> yeah, and I was just gonna say, even from eight years ago when I started in the industry, the amount of technology that producers and farmers are willing to incorporate into their farm has changed drastically and um, a lot of these farms now are willing to try a technology that, that they believe could add value and so um, we're seeing more and more people come to the table and as, as you mentioned actually come out to us and reach out to us and say hey what are some best practices what are some technologies maybe we can look into that better help us and help you um, and, and, and just wanting to know now we're seeing farmers where is my grain actually going? What, which brewery is it gonna end up at? Which food manufacturer is it gonna end up in? So it's kind of come full cycle where the consumer wants to know and now the, the farm wants to know what's, what's it being used for, where's it going, what's the best practice to make it the best product for where it's gonna be used. So I just thought that. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a good comment. Another question. Hi. Um, great conversation. Thanks a lot for the morning call out. Um, I just want to shift it a little bit as a consumer, consumer-oriented question is around, um, we've talked about providence, we've talked about chain of custody validation for the food supply chain. As uh, visionaries in this space, when can I go to my butcher at co-op and say, I want grass-fed beef that uh, is that was slaughtered no longer than three days ago and be able to trust that. Well, the restaurant I was at in Edmonton last week had that. Whether it was true or not, I don't know. But uh, comment? Well, I, uh, I'll jump in if it's okay first. Okay. So um, it's, that's coming up more and more. Uh, so certain parts of the world, they, they have uh, some of those right down to the farm level. Um, and, and the reality is actually is not as difficult because when you want to get down to the farmer level, your supply chain actually be, it becomes a lot more simple, right? Uh, where we work, especially with, with companies like McDonald's, is that we're talking about 10,000 suppliers feeding into systems because they, they, they produce a lot of hamburger, right? And so that has tremendous complexities that we want to know. And also, the other side of it is that we were finding out that some farmers don't want their name on it. They're, they're like, we, we're proud of what we have, but we like our privacy, right? We like to just, pre so, so we're talking about more from, um, maybe it comes from certain regions. So think of wines, right? We don't, we, don't, we don't say, you know, we want to know the guy who picked the grapes, but we want to know what region it came from. And then you got the VQA to, to, to talk about the quality of what you're getting. So in the beef industry, we're kind of nav they're trying to navigate that right now and saying, do the farmers actually want to say that, or the, uh, or the ranchers want to say, like, it's me who, who raised it. Some families do, sometimes don't. And, and, and so the, you know, does the system allow that? We can actually get those type of systems in place today if the retailers want it. And, you know, if they say, but what we see more is that they feature certain families. So I remember, seeing my friends who are ranchers uh, at Sobeys, you know, right above the beef section, and their whole, the, her whole family was there uh, in the picture and say, you know, this is an example one of the producers who create the beef that you're gonna be buying. Yeah. I think, just to add to that a bit, that does exist right now. Um, it's not mainstream, it's not like you, you can walk up to the counter at Safeway and, and get that information. Um, or buy what you're looking for, but there are producers out there starting to go direct to consumer with their product 
And um, you guys, if you're in Calgary, you have a few of them around the city here. You have one in Airdrie. Um, for any of you met or, or talked to Wayne Hansen up there, he is doing that. So you tell, you tell him what you want and he can probably get that for you and he'll slaughter and, and get you that cut, you know, X number of days before you were expecting it. They can do that. Um, the challenge will be taking it more mainstream because that's just one producer serving, you know, a, a finite number of people based on the capacity of his farm. Can you get all producers to that level? Probably, and, and that's where, you know, what Hubert was talking about comes into play. Um, so yeah. Well, that producer you mentioned should call his truck blockchain, and then he could say it was delivered on blockchain. Yeah. <laughs> that sense of humor. Another question. related to uh, digital identity and verified credentials, which is an important part of the trust equation. So what extent um, within the agricultural domain are you starting to see some of those standards either being played out today or the future of them? Well, that's a big question. The, that's a very, very difficult question because um, I've got my lawyer's hat on, and consumer identities, provincial jurisdictions, so they control the health care numbers, the driver's license, and all that kind of stuff. Where I don't know if a cow or grain is subject to jurisdictional things, so I don't know how you would take that. Let's use a cow, for example, as a, I guess you could assign it as a dish. Well, they got the thing in their ear, don't they? They, they got they, the ear tags, yeah. right? And that's part of the, uh, the Canadian identifi uh, cattle identification system. Uh, so, so it's not digital, though, that is it? Have, that, uh, well, it's digitized through through the CLTS database as well as ours. So, so we do have that information, and then we put information on top of that. The, the challenge, of course, when, when you have your tags is that it, what happens if it gets cut off or it falls out and so forth, right? So we, we do talk to our CMPs about investigation of cattle rustling, which does still happen today. Um, so I know internally w things that we are looking at with other companies are a DNA traceability uh, solutions so that you're actually using the DNA tying it back to the ear tags so that you can capture as much information as you can and use it for value added purposes. Uh, the nice thing is at least the, ca uh, the cows are not going to get together and create a lobby group and say, you know, we don't want you to identify who we are. So that makes it a little bit easier in that sense. Uh, but uh, we, we do want to respect the producers' operations and their feedlot operations who, who pull all that information together uh, because there are certain things that they feel is their competitive advantage that they create and they don't want that to be exposed. So. There is a balance in terms of production, and, and, and I mean, we're just talking about cattle here, but this actually applies to pork and, 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 and grains and so forth. It's just at different levels, right? I just realized that blockchain could do away with branding. It can, and we've actually been uh, in fist fights about those two. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll keep my branding <laughs> experiences to myself. Did we answer your question, or did we duck it? Are any of these standards that are starting to move through these standards organizations, are they starting to have an impact? Like, like the central <coughs> identifiers did, verified credentials. Uh, are you talking about standards in production or standards in tracking? Uh, it's, I just want to clarify because they, they, there are different things that are happening. So, for instance, when we talk about sustainability, we have the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And it was a, a, a collaboration from one end in the environmental groups such as the World Wildlife Federation. On the other end, it would be all the producer groups and then the government groups that uh, were associated, the, the schools you know, like Olds is part of that as well, uh, and ourselves who are service providers to create the standards that we can all agree on as indicators to measure if you're sustainable or not. So are you kind of referring to something like that? Uh, that I haven't seen as much, uh, the, uh, to be honest. Uh, uh, there's talks about it, but I don't think it's kind of progressed. And, and so what we've been doing as an approach is drive it through business. So creating business models that people can reference, right? And again, business models must be financially viable. So you know, part of the, the challenge I see in the ag industry, because I've only been in the ag industry for seven years, 
is that when I got in, there was a lot of talk of what should be done, but there was very little talk about how to make money on this. Then it's not long-term viable. So what we try to do is showcase to the industry ideas and solutions that can be implemented respecting all of the different concern groups, but it has to make money for everyone so that it can stay long-term. All right, okay, we got time for one more question. There we go. African swan flu. Uh, what we're hearing is it's uh, killing pigs in Asia by the hundreds of thousands, maybe more. Uh, Chinese duck farmers are becoming millionaires and donkeys are being slaughtered in Western Kenya. Uh, what is the size of the opportunity for Canada? Um, so, a couple things on that. First of all, um, and Hubert probably can attest to this, information we get out of China is not good. Um, they don't like to tell anybody anything about uh, what's going on. I shouldn't say anything, but they, they like to restrict as much as possible. So we don't know what the effect is. It could be anywhere from 25% of their herd to 50% of their herd. We, we don't know, and it could, it could carry on beyond that. Um, but what information is floating around is that it's big. It's, it's probably in that 30 to 35% range based on what, it, what is there. Um, so it's a, it's a huge opportunity for Canada. Um, but just to give you a, a, an idea of what, what role we play in the hog industry, we are very insignificant on the world stage and we do not have the ability to ramp up capacity just like that and, and, and take advantage of this. Um, if we could, pork, the, the information I have is that pork uh, is four times more expensive in China right now than it is here. So if we could somehow capture that and obviously there's gonna be a freight uh, uh, amount to make up in the middle there, but it won't be $3 uh, or uh, three times, I mean. And well, sure, we could do that. The border at the moment, I don't know in the pork side if it's closed or if it's on hold, it's closed. Um, and that's not good, right? How are we gonna take advantage of it when our border is, is at the moment uh, closed on that unless we can somehow ship via another country? Um, but even, in, even doing that, we'll have limitations if they, blockchain existed and they, had, they knew where it was coming from originally, that may not work either. Um, so, yeah, huge opportunity for us. We need the border open, and we need uh, we need to ramp up our production. Which it's not it's it's not something you can just turn a switch on and say I'm gonna double or triple the the size of the Canadian hog industry. You're limited by barn space, really. Yeah, and and, and the um, in fact, actually, you're absolutely right. We don't have this full data on the damage within China, but we do know is that right now, as we speak, the largest pork processor in China is in Calgary. And, uh, and they have been doing a cross Canada tour talking to different pork operations. And uh, I'll be meeting with them tomorrow uh, to, to introduce them to the Alberta pork producers to talk about what can we do. The key here is that even though the borders are on hold, um, we can get moving. Like if we wait until the border opens up again to take actions, it's gonna to be too late. So right now is actually an opportunity to build the relationships necessary to negotiate. And, and, and besides the barn space, the other limitation is the slaughter capacity, right? There, there you can only process so, so many uh, uh, pigs, uh, hogs a day uh, in, in what we have. And one of the other limitations in Canada is that nobody wants to work in those facilities. So they can't even keep a full shift. So, so part of uh, working with the Canadian government is say like, are you willing to allow foreign temporary workers to come in to do these type of work? Because Canadians do not want to do this type of work to increase the slaughter capacity so that we can meet those demands. Uh, what Canada has done, which I think is brilliant, is that we've actually segregated our, our, our hog production uh, into west and east and there is actually a firewall in the middle of our country so that no shipments can go from one to the other so that if the African swine fever uh, hits Canada hopefully it doesn't take out our whole country it only takes out half of our country. 
Well, that's interesting. Well, I'd like to thank the panel. I'd like to thank you for your interest and the questions, and uh, look forward to seeing you later on. Thank you.